So, uh, a warm welcome, everyone, and a grüezi wohl miteinander, of course, from uh, uh, from Switzerland. And I'm really happy to to see you all live and kicking here in front of me, and of course also at home uh, during the live stream. So, what I am going to talk about is uh, I will talk a little bit about in love with data. You remember the original motto of this festival was digital eyes. So I just stuck to the motto, whatever happened. Now I all enough of this pandemic stuff. So since you don't know me, he, a few words about me, and I think that's uh, also already hopefully part of uh, the, the fun bit that I'm going to tell you. My name is Dennis Lück, as it was already was said in the introduction. I am Chief Creative Officer and uh, one of the co-owners of Jungformat. And uh, now the, the title party starts. I think Chief Creative Officer, that's wonderful, Chief, super, Creative, super. But how can you put Officer and Creative into one title? That's something I still don't understand. And here are a few more titles. No one cares about this one. This is the one that I'm really fond of. Uh, you've seen uh, the um, introduction about Die Zeit. Uh, I am one of the four official writers for the NZZ Am Sonntag, which is the equivalent in Switzerland. And now comes the tough bit. Uh, I am a true professor doctor about to lecture you. So there is um, academic credibility in everything I say. And uh, what I want to tell you is uh, a little bit of a problem-solution story that lies behind this funny title. And it tells not just a little bit uh, about the Swiss bureaucracy, it also tells you a little bit about how I tackle problems and also how I work every day. So, where did I get this title from? There was a Swiss University of Arts who wanted to hire me to teach creativity. But there was a little problem they could not hire me due to bureaucratic reasons. If you lecture at a university in Switzerland, you need an academic reference, a diploma, a bachelor, a master, or whatever. And I have nothing. So they wanted me, I wanted to have the job, but it was impossible, so I didn't get the job. And that was annoying me. It kept with me <laughs> all the time. I wanted a solution. And then uh, at one point I heard, that when you donate money for churches in America, they can give away honorary titles. So there was my academic reference. So a couple of weeks later, I had to work in Los Angeles, so I called the Los Angeles Church of Vitality, and I asked them if they needed money. And they said, uh, yeah, okay, I need titles. <laughs> and. Uh, Smart as I am, I got two titles uh, for the price of two, uh, because that costs really money. You really have to donate. So you have to take a little bit of amount uh, of, of, uh, of cash uh, to make that donation. But in return, you really get those honorary titles. And then I thought, wow, super, uh, because I was free to choose the title. And I thought, yes, now I'm doctor of physics, and everybody thinks I'm that monster brain. The problem is that when you, when you donate for a church, the only titles they can give you are titles that come from a church spiritual environment. So that ended up now in really funny titles that I have. So for example, I have my honorary doctor in paranormal psychology. So that means, that means when a poltergeist has a problem, he can come to me, which happened a lot during the last three or four months. So now you might think, that's, that's, that's weird, that's useless. And I thought, yeah, okay, good. But for the professor title, I needed something that I can use every day. The, the professor title, that, that should have power, something useful, something that I can use here at work, in every meeting, here, when I look around, when I look at you, this title is so helpful because I am honorary professor of exorcisms. Yeah, <laughs> so what happened afterwards is, uh, uh, since I had now my official academic reference, I gave it to the university and I said, look, if that position is still open, now I can apply. I have everything. And they said, yes, ah, oh, cool. And then two weeks later, I got a call. Do you want to bullshit us with your blah, blah, blah? I said, yes, of course I want to bullshit you. What, what do you think? What is this? A professor for exorcism. It can't be, can't be serious. No, no, you're never going to get it. And then someone said, wait, 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 wait. Uh, he should teach creativity. And what was this all about here? And then they said, hmm, okay. It was a weird application. It was a creative application. Uh, maybe let's give it a try. 
So in the end, I got the job. And then a couple of weeks later, I thought, okay, if they now they introduce me really as Professor Doctor, and then I have to reveal the story. And now every university in Switzerland, since they copy and paste titles, they copy and paste my title without knowing the fake story behind it. And then I thought, oh, that's fun. That's fun. Let's, let's, let's push it one step further. Then I called the university and again and said, look, I have a new title. Can you please uh, include it uh, in your manual? Because I'm now Professor Dr. Lord. And the, the story behind this title is when you buy a piece of land in Scotland, they uh, give you titles. You, the, if you buy, I mean, I have, what, what I have in Scotland is one square meter of, of forest. But then they, you are allowed to call yourself Lord. So I, it's not really expensive. That only costs 60 francs. That was much cheaper than the Professor Doctor. So now I'm Professor Dr. Lord Dennis Lick when I teach at universities in Switzerland. And Switzerland goes on. Everything that happens in Switzerland is so fun and so bureaucratic, but you always find a way to sneak through. Here's, a, here's the actual sneak through story that happened in Switzerland. I have to give away my driver's license due to an unfair speeding ticket. And what I found out now is that when you have, uh, when you, when you have a tractor, and that tractor can only drive up to 20 kilometers per hour, you are allowed to drive it without a driver's license. So uh, <laughs> I found this tractor now for 1,500 Swiss francs, and uh, I'll be now allowed to drive with my tractor to, to Jung von Matt. So this is uh, a bit about me. So I guess now you get a feeling of how I work. A, a couple of things up front, because we have heard it many, many, many times today, purpose. It's a, it's a buzzword, it's a bingo word. Everybody says, yeah, purpose, purpose, purpose. And everybody comes around and says, look, we have this tomato soup and they want something with purpose. Yeah, and I always ask myself, no, 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 friends, let's start somewhere else. Because what I always ask the people and what I also would like to ask you, what is your purpose to stay in this weird business? I think that's where we have to start. That's where everybody has to start when they start working at Young Format or at your agency or with me. I ask them, what is your purpose in this bloody business? My purpose is I want to collect and cause and generate smiles. So that's my purpose. And that's how I work. Yeah? Because what you all know is we are in a business of reactions. We don't get paid for advertising. We get paid for reactions. Our job is to cause reactions. So smiles and reactions, that, that is a good match. So when I judge ideas, I never think of, ah, is this on brand fit? Is this, uh, do, can I tick that box or this box? I always ask myself, can I trigger reactions? Yeah, when, when I have a briefing, what can I do with it? Can I make people smile? Or can I make people really angry? Or can I provoke or can I shock? That's the only thing I ask my teams if they develop work. And the first uh, example I'm going to show you, there, is a, there was the shittiest briefing of all, which you might know, Christmas cards. When you have to do a Christmas card in an agency, everybody runs away and says, oh, and oh my God, give it to the intern. But when you ask yourself, how can you make people smile and cry laughing with a Christmas card, then different types of creativity evolve. So please have a look at what came up when you say, we want to make people smile with a Christmas card. Three thousand Swiss BMW clients received a Christmas mailing with an integrated sound chip. When they opened the card, a weird version of Jingle Bells began to play. <laughs> QR code or link led to the making of of the fastest Christmas song in the world. And here it is. Hey, 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 hey,
BMW. Within only 10 days, the videos spread around the world. The result, hundreds of thousands of comments in social networks. More than 65,000 e-cards were sent from consumer to consumer. The mailing generated over 120 million contacts worldwide. And all this because a Christmas song was turned into an entertaining PR stunt for BMW. So that's what... Oh, ha, you're too kind. Thank you so much. That's what comes out when you, when you coin your people on causing reactions instead of uh, creating uh, advertising. So today it's all about what I already said, data, the law for data, what has creativity to do with it, and of course, how to see this universe uh, with digital eyes. So this is what we normally do. This is then the advertising. We put lots of media money, that, money uh, to it to get the advertising into the people's heads. But as I already said, I think this is what we can deliver. This is what happens then. And when you create love, uh, uh, then love comes back. So that's, that's the philosophy that sticks be all, behind all this. First of all, I want to tell you how I see data, because when you say data, it's, it, it's, it already gets complex. People run away and think, oh my god, ones and zeros, oh, data, data, data. But data is nothing but insights. The way we work with data is to use it as insights. And insights is nothing but stories about your target group. So what we creatives can do, we can use insights and data to create uh, uh, to, to create and evolve uh, creativity. So we have to see it as a soil to grow our, our ideas on. So data for me is the new tetrahydrocannabinol in our industry. That does not mean that you have to replace the cannabis with data, but it just goes hand in hand. And the next one is, of course, it's a very it's a pun, yes, I know, uh, and I pay 10 francs every time I use this pun, but I think that's, that's how we can use data. And what I'm going to show you today is how we can use data creativity and how we can apply it. So there are a handful of tips that I can give to you that, I hopeful, that hopefully stick with you after this meeting on how to move around in the digital world. Of course, it's way too much to show you here. So as you can see, I'm going to show you, uh, show you how to deal with data-driven targeting, how to use a drive-to-data mechanism, how to use real-time data, how to be able to deploy data scouting, etc. So all of those tips, uh, whatever, uh, uh, it, uh, whatever there is, you can find it here. So there are 10 tips. I'm Maybe we are already running a little bit late. Maybe I will be able to show you four or five. Let's see how far we come. But nothing is lost. Everything I show you is here and you can download it on your mobile. So the first one is uh, in love with data-driven targeting. So this is all about profiling because if you move around in the digital world, you have of course to use uh, CU and CEA. I think you all know it, search engine optimization, search engine um, advertising and what you deal with is words and word combinations. And what I mean with C is you have to really understand where your target audience is, yeah? Because normally when you book AdWords, for example, for uh, a, a hair saloon, you book all the words that are around a hair saloon. You, you book beauty, you book hair, you book but maybe makeup, etc. But now you have to work like a profiler, yeah? Because why do we all go to a barber shop or to a saloon? we get out of the store and have more self-confidence. So now this opens up a new world of words that you can buy. So all of a sudden someone Googles for more self-confidence and then your hair saloon pops up. Yeah, That's all the magic behind this. When you use data-driven targeting and your data is words, you have to work like a profiler in order to get the right words because that's what the people Google and, and then they can find you. And what I did once is I bought uh, all words that belong to Nazis. So I made an Excel list of uh, around 500 words and word combinations that belong to the Nazi world. So of all political parties, what they use, what they talk about, uh, famous names in their parties. Then I went further, I went to right-wing bands, I googled all their bands, I, I bought all the words that belong to them, I, I even bought the words that belong to their songs, etc. So I really dug deep and I bought basically Nazi internet. And it was really cheap because uh, Nazi words are not really popular. So it cost about 1,500 Swiss francs to own Nazi internet for two weeks. And what I had now, I had all the words that Nazis Google. And then now I could use it for whatever I want. 
And I used it uh, for refugees, refugees to announce Nazi videos. So if there is a right-wing propaganda video, it's initiated by a refugee. So have a look how it looked like. Search racism, find truth. A campaign against hate and prejudice. Germany 2016, thousands of refugees flee to the country and are faced with rejection and hate. The greatest weapon of the right-wing extremists is the internet. The organization Refugees Welcome wants to put a stop to the spreading of hate videos with a smart idea and courageous refugees. Unskippable ads were booked and appeared directly before over 100 right-wing videos. For instance, when searching for Lutz Bachmann, the German right-wing leader, you will not get past Arif from Syria, who does away with his prejudices. Lutz Bachmann is going to tell you that all refugees are criminals. I've never been to prison, but Lutz Bachmann has. The Begira boss has been sentenced for theft, assault, robbery and drug dealing. All clips anticipate the content of the following video and rebut the prejudices in them. Indem sie raubend, teilweise vergewaltigend, stehlen und prügeln unsere Städte bereichern. This unskippable ad shows that refugees want to learn the local language and culture. Ein Vorurteil ist also zu sagen, wir möchten nicht eure Sprache lernen. Die Moslems haben sich hier anzupassen und wenn sie das nicht tun, dann können sie gehen, aber schnell. Furthermore, terrible right-wing ad words were booked, leading directly to the stories of the refugees. The news of courageous refugees trolling Nazi content went viral. Governments, politicians, press, and millions of people all over the world shared and commented on the campaign. Refugees Welcome reached an unbelievable boost in supporters and donors. The donations were used to integrate refugees into German communities and culture. The campaign proved that refugees are still welcome in Germany. Don't make me blush. I have too much skin everywhere. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, what happened afterwards was that the, uh, I got threatened by Nazis, which was, which was funny because I thought the threats that I get from my daily business clients is worse <laughs> than what I got from the Nazis. So I took letters that I got from my clients and wrote them to the Nazis. Look, if you want to really threaten me, this is what <laughs> the other clients sent me. Please. <laughs> Make it more, more powerful, make it more aggressive. So, okay, what you saw here is now how to use ad word targeting and how to use it in a creative way. That's where creativity belongs nowadays. You have to be creative in ad words, yeah? Everybody can do a campaign, everybody can do draws nicely, whatever, but this is where the creativity has to go now. And now I show you the complete opposite when I don't want to buy ad words, yeah? Because I'm a big brand. They should find me voluntarily. So what this is all about is drive to data mechanisms. Yeah, don't find them, let them find you. So it's, it's, it's absolutely the opposite mechanism. And it works like this when I tell you don't think about a pink elephant. Yeah, you, okay, you all know it. You think about a pink ele ele elephant. So in a digital world is don't Google pink elephant. Yeah, that, that's the same mechanism. And when, when, when I create this buzz around, oh, you, you, you can't Google pink elephant. No, it's, 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 it's forbidden to Google for a pink elephant, yeah? You, you, you shouldn't, not in St. Pauli, not, not here. In Switzerland they can, but I heard, I heard they did it. That, that's the mechanism, when you forbid things, people do it. And then they start to search for you. So it's, it's, it's this dark bone profit, mountain, mountain to the profit, that's the mechanism behind it. And when you then use a powerful insight, then things go off from alone. So what I used here is, a, is an insight that you, I think, <laughs> all experienced, uh, maybe not nowadays, but that's, a, that's an insight. When you, look, when you look at holiday pictures from other people and you yourself are not on holidays, you sit at your desk or you sit in your home office and you see holiday pictures from others on, on Instagram, on Facebook or whatever, you feel angry. Yeah, it is scientifically proven that it makes you feel worse. <clears throat> you clinch because you can't be in holidays now. So uh, with 
our client uh, Graubünden Tourism, which is uh, Swiss, beautiful Swiss Alps and mountain villages. And for that client, we had to advertise the beauty of Swiss mountain villages. And now comes the pink elephant. We said, okay, if the truth is that uh, people feel bad when they look at holiday photos, uh, we have to ban people from taking photos in Graubünden. So there was an official ban not to take photos and post them on Instagram and Facebook on the soil in Graubünden. You, get, you got fined with five francs that went in to support mountain and animals in the mountains, etc. But you, got, you really got a fine when they caught you taking pictures and posting them on Instagram. So uh, the idea was, uh, okay, we banned holidays, and uh, what the only thing we did is we, we, we have the written law, and we sent the law to all tourism offices, tourism magazine, tourism blogs. There's a crazy Swiss uh, uh, region where they ban taking pictures for social media. And uh, that alone, those, uh, those send outs of, of the law generated a, a huge buzz around it. But on the second day, uh, we said we have to ban <laughs> someone else from taking pictures. And uh, now please enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy Swiss English. Dear NASA, we are a small municipality in Graubünden, Switzerland. We have discovered that pictures of our beautiful village are being shared on social media, which is making other people unhappy because they cannot be here. That's why we have officially forbidden photography here. Because we want everyone to be happy. NASA, you take some really beautiful satellite pictures from space. And we have found that there are some of our village. Please, can you delete them or blur them? Then people who can't be here won't be sent. Thank you very much. The coordinates of our municipality are 46, 37, 48, North, 9, 44, 59, 99, East. I repeat, 46, 37, 48, North, 9, 44, 59, 99, East. Thank you very much, NASA. Kind regards from Bergen in Switzerland. So see, this is then what happens afterwards. Uh, we did this, we did a little prank with the NASA, and then again, reactions. We wanted to cause reactions from the people. And this is what happened in the international press, as you can see. And remember the briefing, advertise Swiss mountain villages. Too beautiful in the headline. This town is so beautiful. Too pretty for Instagram. Too beautiful. Too beautiful, top right. So idyllish. So adorable. So it was then all around in the press uh, after a couple of days. And as, as I said, this is what, when you, what you do, or the, what, how you can do it when you, want to peop, uh, when you want the people to Google yourself. And now there's a little bit uh, of a, a summary of that case and look at how it worked on Google. This is Peter Nikolai, the proud mayor of the little village of Bergun in the Swiss Alps. Bergun urgently needs more tourists, but unfortunately, nobody has even heard of Bergun. That's why Peter is starting a campaign, together with all the village's inhabitants. The idea, the village would ban photography, so that nobody would become sad about not being in beautiful Bergun whenever they looked at photographs of the area. This isn't a joke. Thanks to the Swiss system of direct democracy, the village was able to pass a real law. Friendly photography ban so that nobody would become sad about not being in beautiful Bergun. The wording of the law was sent to the press, and after just 24 hours, news of the ban had spread all over the world. Peter and the rest of the village used social media to promote the campaign, and even NASA was requested to refrain from taking pictures from space. Forbidden photography here. Bergun immediately became a trending topic. Google image search exploded. 
Bergoon banned photography, and now people all over the world search desperately for photos of Bergoon, discovering how beautiful the place really is. And that's exactly what Peter had in mind. After two days, the mayor wound up the campaign, issuing camera owners with a special permit and inviting tourists to photography courses. Now everyone has heard of the little village of Bergoon. The results. In just three days, 1,622 articles about the beauty of the village were published. This resulted in a reach of 897.2 million contacts. And all with a media budget of zero, but earned media worth 9.1 million Swiss francs. Bookings for Bergoon rose by 470%. Now everyone can once again take photographs of the beautiful village. And Bergoon is now on the bucket list of many future tourists. Please part in Bergoon. So if you want to dis yeah, thank you. If you want a discount for a holiday in Bergoon, give me a shout. I think we have room for one more. I have to gain a little bit of, uh, of time uh, so that the other speakers uh, also have their time left. Uh, the last one I want to show you is uh, in love with data scouting. Again, data, data, data. We all think about it as a mystery. But when you, when you scout for data and when you read and interpret data, it's nothing but what comes out of market research. So all those fancy names, data miners, data analysts, or whatever, basically it's the result of cleverly looking at data and finding out what it means. So for example, if you looked at the, at the data from uh, an online uh, shoe store, so if women buy shoes for their children, in 83% of the cases, they also buy shoes for themselves. So that's what data says, yeah? So the only thing you have to do then as a communicator is to make bundles. So that's the result then uh, of the data. Or another fun fact is when on Valentine's Day there was someone listening for sorry on Spotify 242 times. So there's already, as you can see, there's already storytelling in that little data. Maybe he was left or he, he cheated and whatever, something happened. And then streaming data says that Slayer should play in Wohlen, Switzerland, because uh, in Wohlen, Switzerland, the streaming data for Slayer is better than maybe in Hamburg. Yeah? The streaming data tells them where to have their next big show. And what we had to, uh, to, to uh, acknowledge is that 75% of all physical books, so the real books, uh, are bought by people aged 55 plus. So parents... They buy books on Kindle, yeah? and then they give the Kindle to their children and let them have a, a look at, at, at the Kindle children book. So no more the physical book. But grandparents still buy physical books, and they also go into the store. And that was the data insight. So as you can see, there is data, there is an insight, and it does not have to end up in a super technical data case. You just have to use the data to build the journey around it. And that's what happened when we had to, um, uh, when we had to advertise books for children. Uh, so there's a Swiss publishing house that gave away a new bestseller book uh, in Switzerland, and we had to make sure that this physical book gets sold. And now with this data insight in, in mind, uh, we created um, a little PR fact around the data that we had. So children books for only grandparents buy them and uh, we wanted to use that as a little stunt. Children's books have the power to bring families and generations together simply because they're read aloud to children. This power was used to launch the long-awaited sequel to the best-selling Swiss children's book Jan and Judgin with a heartwarming and exclusive pre-sale only for grandparents. An integrated campaign focusing on grandparents announced that during the three weeks before the official sales launch, only grandparents could buy the sought-after children's book. Hordes of grandparents homed in on the bookshops from the very first day of the pre-sale. Wir ältere Leute kommen da auch einmal ein bisschen zuerst dran. Die meisten freut mich einer von den ersten Zeit von das Buch abholen. Grandparents were required to prove their authentic grandma or granddad status at the cash desk by providing evidence such as family photos, drawings or letters from their grandchildren. Of course, presentation of an actual grandchild was also accepted. In online stores too, the book could only be ordered by grandparents, who were then required to make a digital grandparents promise. Each book comes with a train ticket, which the grandparents can use to invite their grandchildren to a personal reading. 
The playful use of e-commerce helped grandchildren to inform their grandparents about the pre-sale via the campaign website, by WhatsApp, email or SMS. Ja, hat sich ja gefreut, wo wir sagen, wir gehen das Buch geholt und wir werden das heute Nachmittag oder gegen Abend miteinander anschauen und nicht noch mal lesen. Der Vorverkauf ist mega gut gelaufen. Wir sind von den Großeltern regelrecht überrannt worden. The exclusive pre-sale catapulted our children's book to the top of the bestseller list on day one. The first edition was sold out after 12 days. The most important thing, however, is that this special pre-sale brought together thousands of families across several generations by turning grandparents into heroes for their grandchildren. So did you see the little trick? I mean, only grandparents buy the book and we just banned the parents from buying it. So actually there is no effect at all. The grandparents would have bought it anyways and the parents wouldn't have bought it anyway. But we said this pre-sale is only for, uh, for grandparents came coming out from the from the data inside that we had from their cash desks. So, my friends, I hope you enjoyed some weird Swiss stuff. <laughs> and uh, uh, what I can uh, tell you is that all the stuff that I've uh, shown you and everything else is here to be found for you. And I think the only thing that should stick with you is when you develop work, ask yourself, what is the reaction I want to cause? That's it, my friends. Stay healthy and smile like crazy. Thank you so much.